Um, but, but tell me something about your background, because we listened to this interview with the Canadian radio, and, and you show an incredible understanding about the economy of the world, really, and well, how, what makes it tick. And I'm just wondering, where did you learn everything that you learned okay, in that well, way? Well, of course, I did all the, you know, the university classes and right. economics and stuff. But basically, for over 20 years, I've been following it, writing about it. I mean, everybody comes through Tokyo, presidents, prime ministers, finance ministers, they have their G7s and all that stuff. I've been interviewing gangsters, prime ministers, finance ministers, presidents of big companies, presidents of small companies, you know, just more than 20 years, almost 30 years interviewing all sorts so of people. So it's an education in itself, I guess. In yeah. So the, the first job I got was, was with an outfit called Knight Ritter, which was part of the Knight Ritter newspaper chain, so it was right. a, but it was their financial wire. So uh, I would go and meet finance ministers and governors of Bank of Japan and stuff, and mm -hmm. all the market news. So uh, my stories would move the dollar, or move the yen, or move the price of commodities every week, just back and forth. And it's, it's really amazing to see that what I learned there as a financial market reporter is that it's really finance is mass psychology. It's mob psychology. Um, and that was a very interesting lesson that you don't learn in the school club. A lot of other financial journalists out there who are towing the party line. Well, and this is categorically what you haven't been doing. You're a real maverick in this field. Well, you see, it's very high-level propaganda. They're brainwashed. They really, really do not understand at the essence of what it's all about. Um, and that's the trick. They're, they try to get people sidetracked into esoteric mathematics and they try to cover it with lots of complex words. So, you know, they come up with these derivatives that are so complex that most people don't even understand what they mean anymore. Like, I remember even almost 15 years ago or more talking about delta hedge formations and, you know, and, and so they get into this stuff and it blinds them. It's like almost a deliberate, you know, uh, confusion, because at the essence, it's really very simple. Economics is people working to earn their living. And finance is a process of deciding what people will do next. And they try to not let us understand this, especially the part about finance. And that is the, the key to the world's problems now. I thought the finance ministry was the real source of power in Japan. That's what people believe. It was the most powerful bureaucracy. But when I started talking to finance minister people, uh, when I started talking to people at the finance ministry, they told me, finally, if you really want to know what's going on, you have to go to Nomura Securities. And this was in the 80s. It's different now. But in the 80s, <coughs> during the bubble, Nomura Securities had a VIP list of 5,000 people. And they had these two bosses, the big Tabuchi and the little Tabuchi, uh, not related, who were later proved to be connected to a big gang, a crime gang. But they would take all these journalists, politicians, come, you know, all you know, the sort of top movers and shakers, and they'd lend them a couple million dollars. And they'd say, buy this stock. And then they would take every salesman in the country and all their journalistic connections and say, these are the stocks you've got to buy now. And every housewife and small businessman and doctor would buy these stocks, the price would go up, and the VIPs would sell. So that was how they controlled politics. So no, you say it's different now, so how is it different? Well, it's different players, different uh, ways of handing out the money. Um, this is a question I'd like to bookmark, because I remember that you said to Rents that you felt that, in your opinion, the U.S. debt was $120 trillion. And I went and looked it up and thought, I wonder where that figure comes from, so I'd like to ask you that. Well, I can tell you right now, the, the, the $66 trillion comes from the, the essay by uh, Professor Kilborn that was published by the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve Board branch in 2005. And that's the money they owe to American citizens. Um, you know, stuff they promised to pay, like uh, Medicaid and uh, Social Security and things like that. 
it's in that essay, you can find it. Now, the other 53 trillion is the amount of dollars out in circulation outside of the U.S. That's the amount of... I gotcha. So add them together and you get 120 trillion. Okay, so this housing, you've got the housing... All right, so here's the point, is that they were going... I was working for the Nihon Keizai Shimbun at this point. It's like the Japanese Wall Street Journal. It's in Japanese, but it's okay. their number one business finance newspaper by far. And they were talking about pouring in tens of billions of dollars in taxpayer money to bail out these companies. And there were some weird discussions about uh, borrower responsibility. Borrower responsibility, what's going on here? And so I sort of said, well, who are these borrowers? And it turns out, this is my sources were people at the Bank of Japan and uh, various other agencies, like uh, credit rating agencies, that more than half the loans were made to gangsters, to Yakuza gangs. So it was very, to me, it was an amazing thing. Here we have the government using tens of billions of dollars of taxpayer money to bail out uh, companies that lent money to gangsters. And they were all headed by former finance ministry officials. So you see a link now between the finance ministry officials, uh, politicians, and gangsters. And they're using taxpayer money to give to the gangsters, right? So, uh, I wrote this up in the English Nikkei, and there was a huge reaction. Over 400 foreign journalists or magazines wrote similar stories. Half the juice, uh, the housing loans were lent to gangsters, right? And then Newsweek wrote a story, almost identical to mine. And then the Nikkei, their own paper, said, according to Newsweek, half the loans to the housing to the juice and companies or to Yaksa. And I went to the editor, I said, hey, I wrote that story first, why do you say according to Newsweek? And they called me up and they gave me the editor's award and uh, $50. <laughs> and then they told me, um, Mr. Fulford, you know, re you really shouldn't write stuff like that. It's just not done and it could be dangerous. And after that they started watching me. And they would not let me write anything except the stuff the government announced. Wow. So and this is after you left Forbes. You're writing before, for the... Before I got to Forbes. Oh, before you got to Forbes. Okay. Right? So I started to realize the Japanese press was not at all free. I see. And, uh, you know, it turns out there was an editor at the Nikkei, Mr. Otsuka, who won a bunch of awards for writing about the Ito Man scandal, which... And then he was suddenly sent off to some weird subdivision, removed from the reporting business. And he got very suspicious, and he started following the president around. It turns out they lent like $100 million to gangsters, money that would never come back. And the Itoman scandal was another huge one, which basically Japan's, one of Japan's largest banks, the Sumitomo Bank, had been taken over by a crime syndicate. That's what the story really boiled down to. It's a, it's a long, complicated thing, but... Um, anyway, I started to realize that the, the newspapers and the politicians and the bureaucrats and the gangsters were all in together in some kind of crooked power structure that was totally different from what people were seeing on their television or reading in their newspapers. Mm -hmm. And I got totally disgusted when they started suppressing my stories. So I quit the Nikkei. Uh, I worked as a freelancer for South so China Morning Post, a bunch of places. I started digging deeper. But then, suddenly, Forbes starts putting pressure on me. I had a story about GE doing some very funky accounting here, with, involving billions of dollars. That, you know, They killed it without explanation. And then right. Citigroup was kicked out of Japan for you know, money laundering uh, for gangsters. They were kicked out. And that story didn't run, right? Um, and finally, what for me was the last straw was a antivirus so software company paid a guy to make a virus, a computer virus, right? And I talked to the guy who made the virus, you know, and he's, some, he's supposed to be some guy living in a Filipino slum, but he's got a brand new $20,000 car, you know. And anyway, they said to me, well, 
this guy is the president of the company is a friend of Mr. Forbes and he bought a lot of advertising and so we're not running a story. Oh. So they told you